here we are at London Tech Week and I'm so delighted to be joined of course by our head of business platforms uh, Rotan Hershko and our head of innovation at Accenture Ryan Shanks so you're both here speaking at London Tech Week mm -hmm. which we'll get to in a moment but let's start with you Rotan can you tell us why is technology so important for the improvement um, of global supply chains yeah, that's a big question, Sam. Yeah. Um, let me try and answer that in, in a few, reflecting on a, f a few different points. Um, and so one thing that is really important to know is about the scale of global supply chain. Uh, and so every given moment, just to talk about the shipping side of things, which is not comprehensively global supply chain, but just as mm -hmm. an, an avenue, every given moment, 40 million containers are moving around the world. 40 million of them. Now each container will move up to six times a year and up to 25 years uh, lifespan per container. Um, and, and that's only on the shipping side. Now if you try to add to that all the different transportation modes, if it's air or tracks or rail, uh, and you add to that the complexity of crossing borders, and everything that happens in the different custom offices and everything that happens about tax and compliance and legal, mm -hmm. then you see that this, this industry, the scale of, of what we're dealing with is, is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is no better avenue to go after scale than technology and automation. So that's one uh, lens that we can put on. Um, the other one uh, is about how manual uh, the industry is. And so we see that on the shipping side and on the logistics side, which we're dealing with every day. Uh, but I know that our customers are feeling that from their perspective as well. The interaction, the way we exchange, the exchange data is very manual. Uh, and so if there is like, uh, if there are 30 different parties, 30 different companies that needs to touch one container to move between countries, and then there's hundreds of people and 200 data points and documents that needs to be uh, moving around just to support one transaction. You can imagine how many people sitting at the back end, how many people are helping uh, to make this supply chain magic happens. And then on the customer side, since everything or so many of these processes are manual, how many people they need uh, to support their needs. And so it's a very fragmented and manual industry. Uh, and the last area that I'll touch is about uh, global warming and our environment and the yes. planet, which is very close to our heart at Maersk, but I'm sure close mm -hmm. to many of your customers mm -hmm. as well. Uh, just just on, the, on the logistics side, uh, we omit around 3.5 billion tons of CO2 every year, the logistics industry. Yes. Uh, Maersk has a big part of that as well. Uh, and so the combination of this huge scale multi-mode industry that touching so many hundreds of different countries and so many billions of, of customers that sitting at the end wanting to get their product with how much manual and fragmented the processes are and the deep connection to the future of our planet mm. makes technology the perfect avenue to be invested in. Uh, to help us automate and digitalize the end-to-end -end supply chain solutions. And you touched upon the future of our planet and you mentioned digitization and automation. So these are some of the tech areas we could be looking at. But from Accenture and your experience, mm. what are some of the tech trends that we need to be keeping an eye on and what could be those opportunities for logistics? One of the words that comes to mind is convergence. Right? Um, you are at the middle of a lot of industries making, making the world and making commerce happen, basically. And, and I think of the same with tech. Um, you know, there are specific tech trends, but um, I think the further advances in AI, uh, which I think there's still a lot of productivity and improvements to be driven out of that, not just from a cost perspective, but also in a value add uh, perspective. And we're beginning as well further R&D in the quantum space. So, you know, once we can get into that uh, um, level of, of data analysis, I think the, the opportunities start to broaden even more. But if I put next to that, and I think of your ships out all around the world, a couple of other areas we're looking at is um, 5G and edge computing, and add into that space and the commercialization of space. Now, again, this is a little bit more of a 
in our Accenture world a horizon, you know, a further horizon opportunity, but one we've actually started to declare that we're interested in, um, to understand how can we bring AI with the connectivity uh, of 5G edge computing together with SPICE, and these things start to converge, and there's really interesting opportunities that start to, to arise. And I could imagine, and of course you know supply chain better than I do, I would say, but, but the, um, the tracking and the insights of how to optimize logistics, because I know that's what I hear from our consumer packaged goods re and our retailers, and I was just this morning meeting an energy uh, client, a big one of the oil majors, you know, insights across the supply chain of understanding where stuff is and how they can optimize it is so important. What you're talking about is visibility, really, with the tracking and the data. Exactly, yeah. I know this is an area, of course, that your team uh, is very really heavily invested in and looking into. Yes, it's, it's true, and, and it's also uh, really uh, important to um, at least share from you know, our perspective on the mm -hmm. ground is that um, this manual way of operating, mm -hmm. those just talking about before, the manual way of booking, pricing, contracting, mm -hmm. post price, uh, post purchase experience, and everything in between, is the enemy of data. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really it's really hard for us to capture data in a systematic, comprehensive, real time, mm -hmm. rich way if we operate in a manual way. Mm -hmm. And so this effort about modernizing our technology, putting technology front and, ser and center, moving to the cloud, building on the e all the infrastructure to automate, comes exactly from that reason of at the end of the day, and in some cases we're already doing it today, but not yeah. comprehensively, is our wish to serve customers better with mm -hmm. better machine learning and AI and mm -hmm. control towers mm -hmm. and all of these elements that can then take the data, optimize and, and apply the, these advanced mm -hmm. technologies. Mm -hmm. We haven't started thinking about the space yet, to be honest, <laughs> uh, but maybe that's something that we can take back home. But definitely on everything data uh, and everything optimization and visibility is really close uh, to our heart as well. Mm. So we've heard here from uh, Rotom just talking about some of the things that we're doing, but I'd love to get your insights when it comes to some of those best practices when it comes to driving an innovation culture, especially in a company that's a legacy company. We've been going for 118 years. Mm. Can you share some of your insights there? Broadly, there's three things I think about when I think of big bigger legacy companies as, as you describe them. Um, the first is the word innovation, which is actually in and of itself a bit of a challenge. Sometimes I have some companies who I go and speak to and they hear innovation and you can almost see the eyes roll back in, in their head, you know, oh, here we go, you know, you got to a... Um, and, and really when we get into it that I talk about what sort of portfolio of improvements do we want to talk about at this particular organization and, and, and particularly in larger companies there are, let's say, lower risk, higher opportunities for improvement sort of things that drive out efficiency. And let's face it, where we're at in the world today as well, staring into inflation, looking at what could be happening with the recession coming. These sorts of things, driving efficiency, operational improvements, new and novel ways of doing that. The world needs more of that. All of our clients that I work with need that. And so that's a, it's a good piece of innovation. Of course, it can also mean, how do I completely reimagine my company because of sustainability, right? We have energy companies or grid companies uh, automotive companies. I was speaking to one of the major automotive players in Germany. I mean, cars are essentially iPhones with wheels now. <laughs> when you hear of the challenges that what they're trying to imagine of the way that the car was working for. So the first point, I think, is understanding what a risk appetite and what ambition it is when we say the word innovation. And, and for most organizations, it's about 70% making the core business better. Um, and that's not unusual, and it's usually it is. It's not just as I said earlier, space and things like that. We'll do a, we'll do a few of those things like that, but, but often the core of innovation is, is driving out improvements in the core business in order to feed some of those broader ambitions. Um, the second area that I would mention of the lessons learned that I've had is um, what I would call robust ideas, those that are most likely to scale. That's something I get the question of, uh, Many of our ideas don't scale. What are, what's the secret sauce that we may be seen across a number of yep. places? And, and it is really ideas that are technology fueled, but also with a serious design lens and human lens. To go back um, to the old notion of, of fulfilling uh, those sorts of jobs to be done, actually understanding what problem this thing is solving and tech, and then business models. So for instance, I had a, um, a project we did at an airport where we looked at um, how could we help people move around in airports more seamlessly, which 
uh, again, I know where we're at in the world today, that's probably something well, we all would like to, to be better. Exactly. All of yes. us. Exactly. All of us would love that. Well, the technologists and designers find beautiful ways using beacons, IoT and other things in order to design things to a parent with two kids that they're trying to bring through, can go through. But not dissimilar as you discussed as well with the global shipping system. An airport is a very complicated ecosystem of government entities, contractors, retailers, airport authorities, uh, airlines. And to try to get them all to work together, I think, can be the challenge. And so the third area I call it is, is sort of commercial model and business model innovation. Um, how do we rethink the way we exchange value between a whole ecosystem? Uh, and finally, ethics. Ethics, privacy, and trust is the fourth and final piece that I, that I look for increasingly nowadays. Um, we have examples of where we have done work in banking, for instance, to help help banks to improve the financial health of their customers, leveraging data that's available to them in their systems and so forth. Um, uh, but what right does a bank have to be nudging you to do yes. that? Um, there's, it, there's interesting areas in pharmaceuticals um, with data and health. And as soon as you hear that, you know, little alarm should go off slightly. Okay, what are we doing with that data? Do they know we're using that data? How do we use it go forward? So there are these should we questions, I call them, that in this day and age, we have some of that as well. So. If we can create these more well-rounded ideas, I get excited when the technologists, my designers, my business person, and some sort of ethics or thing has been thought of. And when those things all sing, it's an idea it's hard to say no to. If you ignore any one of them because it's more convenient or you just think, oh, I'll just take that question much later, it, it ends up creeping up on you at some point. So I like to look at ideas that are well-rounded. And, and finally, I think my third point in this is, I call it the air game and ground game. Uh, and do, do um, address the changes on both levels. Um, I have some companies that I speak to who are all about the air game. And the air game is we want to transform our company into a whole new business area. Or our legacy systems are so messed up and so Frankenstein, I can't do anything until those are all fixed. Or we're going to redo our whole P&L for customer segments instead of products. And until that's done, we're not going to do anything. So there are these big, heavy questions. The ground game is some of the folks that in many companies just roll up their sleeves and do it. They tend not to like slides. They like yeah. just to try it out, get out of the market. Let's see if this works. Let's try this interesting use of AI internally and see if we can improve quality management. You know, they, they roll up their sleeves and do it. So some of my clients and companies I work with, they, they have an air game, but no ground game. And so they come to me looking exhausted, just like, oh, you know, this whole thing is just, you know, there's no energy and everything is, is really difficult. I have others that have a ground game with no air game. And usually what they're telling me is we have this accelerator, we have this thing over here. It, it does all these ideas, but nothing scales. I don't understand. They never invest any money in anything. Nothing ever scales. And so what we talk about is how to drive the air game and the ground game at the same time yes. in a very iterative way. So we'll do enough air game to say, well, we decided we want to be a company like this and roughly in these areas, then get those multidisciplinary teams working on it and then learn as fast as possible and then shoot it back up, inform the strategy. And we may change a strategy because of the ground. I think the orthodoxy that it all comes from on high and people on the ground have to do what the senior people say. It can go the opposite direction as well as we continuously learn through the through the process. And I think that's one of the exciting things I learned as well from places like Climate Tech when we're here. Yeah. It's how ent entrepreneurs think. You know, in our big company worlds, we don't always have the luxury. You know, we, we can be stuck in our particular orthodoxies and the way things work. Whereas if it's your own company and your own money, you kind of figure out how things happen and you do enough strategy to get you going and then you have to roll your yeah. sleeves up and do. And I think that's um, at the end of the day, when it comes to innovation in the corporate setting, we're trying to reawaken a bit of that entrepreneurial spirit to experiment and try and, yes. and get on with it. Yeah. We've recently had our own CEO talking about inverting the pyramid. So when you're talking about air yeah. and ground, and also yeah. we've had a recent talk with our CTIO, Navneet, very much about making sure one doesn't get ahead of the other. So yeah. can you share some insights mm. there about what we're doing? We are thinking or, or trying to implement similar concept and the way we frame it at Maersk is we need to walk and run at the same time. Mm. Uh, but I think it's under the same umbrella uh, of A, uh, we have to make some hypotheses and then go and test and learn and mm. get data and get feedback and get some insight from customers. And that's the right way to prove or disprove mm. and, and go after for the next one and the next one and the next one that innovation is, 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 always, uh, is always coming. 
Uh, and then we need to do that while supporting and helping customers today, mm. here and now. Mm. The business is booming in every front, in every country. Yeah. Uh, and so we need to do the here and now. Uh, but then, of course, we need to think about five years down the road, where do we want to go and how can we serve the customers even better? And what do we need to do today? in our infrastructure, in our technology uh, systems, in the way we operate, in our organizational chart. What do we need today to do today so in five years from now uh, we can hit this mark and serve customers better? And so this notion of A, don't wait for a perfect solution to come and, and just be on a waiting, uh, holding position, uh, that's something that I understand and, and it's really important not to fall to this trap, but then combining the here and now and the future and, and merging and, and, and pushing all of them at the same time is definitely a challenge uh, that we are facing, but at least we understand that uh, and, and we're not uh, gonna uh, uh, let it slip through any crack. We're focusing there.